hello, class. Welcome back. I'm Professor Watson, uh, and this is Contracts, LGLA 1351. Welcome back. Um, uh, this week, I guess we've already made it to, to, to week six, right? So uh, we're on chapter five in our book. Uh, we have finally reached consideration. OK, so this is uh, week five consideration. This is a big deal. This is is kind of where the river meets the road. And um, and so uh, we're going to spend a good time talking about it. this is kind of a long chapter. This will um, uh, we'll try to split this up into at least two lectures uh, so that it doesn't drone on for too long. Uh, but I'm looking forward to this one because consideration is so important. So this is a chapter five, lecture one uh, on uh, uh, consideration. All right. So uh, welcome. I, I hope you've already uh, read the chapter. I hope you've already taken a look at, uh, at my class notes or my lecture notes. If those help you, uh, you're welcome to, to follow along in those if those help. Otherwise, um, you've also got the PowerPoint on our course materials. You can take a look at that. Uh, so let me put that up on the screen and let's get started because we've got a lot to cover. Um, all right. Let me see if I've got that here. Uh, there we go. All right, chapter five, consideration. So again, let's always remember to go back to the basics and let's start from the beginning. Remember, there are five elements. I know I've got, five, I know it says four, your book says four. Uh, we've got five there. Uh, we can keep talking about whether legality and capacity are elements or whether they're conditions. But either way, remember, you've always got these uh, five things that you need to consider with every contract. Uh, first, you have to have an agreement or a meeting of the minds. Then you have to have consideration, mutuality, uh, capacity, legality. We'll get to all those. But this week, uh, so the last two weeks, we've been talking about agreement. Remember two weeks ago, we talked about agreement and offer and acceptance and meeting of the minds and a manifestation of mutual assent. Remember all those things? Uh, and then last week, we talked about, uh, um, we only had that we, the first element. And then we already talked about ways to um, uh, to invalidate a contract, if you had if you had reached an agreement, well, well, are there some legitimate ways to get out of it? If there were things like uh, remember fraud, uh, misrepresentation, maybe a mutual mistake or duress, uh, undue influence, or even uh, that that catch all. Remember, um, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, our catch-all was when that it was just so beyond um, unconscionability, when it was so beyond um, the pale, so beyond, not just unfair, but so grossly unfair uh, that a court just couldn't bring itself to enforce the contract, right? Then we might have unconscionability. So those were the, the, the six ways that we talked about to invalidate assent. And so now finally, we're moving on to uh, the second element consideration. So uh, let's take a look at that. What, what is consideration? Um, um, all right. Well, I mean, we, of course, we could start with uh, consideration is the second element of any enforceable contract, right? So uh, so what do we know about that? Well, we know no consideration, then, then no contract. We, we could start right there. No consideration, no contract. But, um, uh, but what is consideration? Um, you can find a hundred defini definitions out there. Again, you know, Black's Law Dictionary, the common law, we always mention those, right? And, and most of those are going to be similar, right? Um, uh, your book says that consideration is something promised, something given, refrained, or done that has the effect of making a, an agreement a legally enforceable contract. Um, okay, well, that's, that's somewhat helpful. It's something that you have to do to make a contract uh, uh, enforceable. Um, it has to at least be something that you did or gave or or agreed not to do. Um, so that, that that's that's a little information, but maybe not terribly helpful. Uh, Black's Law Dictionary gives the definition that consideration is the inducement to a contract, the cause, motive, price, or impelling influence, the the thing that that for, that, that that drove you or induced you in a contracting party into entering a contract. Um, it goes on to describe a, co a consideration as a, a right. It can be an interest. It can be a profit or a benefit that accrues to one party. Or it can be a forbearance, meaning something that you had a right to do, but you gave up, right? A forbearance, a detriment, a loss, a responsibility given, suffered, or undertaken by the other party. Well, that's kind of long, right? That, that, kind of long and detailed there, and there's a lot to unpack. It looks like um, it involves benefits, right? Rights and interest and profits. Um, it, it involves responsibilities uh, like forbearance and detriment and loss. Um, 
Um, I think that I have a better definition for uh, for consideration, one that may help you a little more. Now, uh, my definition is not one that you're going to find in any book. It's not one that you're going to find in in any uh, judicial opinion. But I think perhaps um, it, it goes more to the point and it will help you remember what consideration is. All right. So my definition of consideration is that that consideration is what you give for what you get. OK, consideration is what you give for what you get. And that's my own definition. Don't go, um, don't go citing me uh, to your, your boss or your managing partner or to a judge. Um, I haven't published that anywhere. And, and what kind of authority am I? But, but in, in all my years of, uh, first of all, trying to understand consideration myself, and, and then second, trying to, to help students understand what consideration means, I believe that what you give for what you get is maybe the best definition uh, of consideration uh, that I've ever heard. It helps you understand that that both sides have to have to have some kind of skin in the game, right? They've got to have some kind of responsibility, or they've got to give up something. Right? And at the same time, both sides to a contract, or, or if you have more than more than two parties, all sides to a contract have to get something. They have to receive some kind of benefit, something that they wanted, something that they contracted for. Uh, that's consideration. It's what you give for what you get. There, there's two parts of it, right? You have to give something and get something, or there's not consideration. We're going to talk about a lot more about that today, okay? Uh, so let's get started. Again, consideration is the second element of a contract, as your book pointed out. Um, no consideration means no contract. And that's something you have to always be careful of. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen lawyers draft a contract and they draft it and boy, they try hard and they do all they can to give um, to give their client all the benefit. Um, and make sure that their client has no obligation to the other side. And the, the problem is if you go too far, then you don't have consideration. And if you don't have consideration, then it doesn't matter how much you paid your lawyer drafted. It's not a contract. Because uh, let's make sure you understand this. Who has to get something? Who has to receive something? Every party to the contract must receive something, okay? Not just one. Contracts aren't one-sided. Remember our, our original definition of contract? It is a, a set of mutually enforceable promises, right? Both sides have to receive something in order for it to be consideration. Um, who will then, who has to give up something? Again, both sides have to give up something in order for it to be consideration, right? So both sides have to give both sides have to get, or if you have more than two parties, all sides have to give up something. All sides have to get something, or there's not consideration. Consideration is what you give for what you get. Every party must, must have an obligation and a benefit from a contract. Okay. Um, well, what must be given or what must be uh, received? Well, the answer there is pretty broad, just about Every, just about anything, right? Just about anything that you want to contract for, just about anything you desire um, can be consideration for a contract. Now, of course, there's a few limitations. It has to be legal, right? It has to be legal, but otherwise, just about anything large or small can be consideration. So um, is a million dollars consideration? Sure it is. If you're giving a million dollars, the other side is getting a million dollars. That could be consideration. Um, what about a peppercorn? Remember we had that, that discussion at the, 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 beginning of, um, the beginning of the semester. We talked about uh, this idea of a peppercorn. And that comes from, that comes from old common law, from, from, from England, even before uh, European settlers were, were coming uh, to the Americas. Um, we had common law on contracts. And in those cases, the courts discussed that, that even a peppercorn uh, could be consideration. And what did they mean? They meant as long as you got something, no matter how small, as long as you got something, as long as you got what you bargained for, then that could be consideration. It's important to understand that courts are not going to weigh consideration. If you give a peppercorn and get a million dollars, the other side gets a peppercorn and gives a million dollars, then you have consideration. Both sides gave something. Both sides got something. What did they give and get? They gave and got what they bargained for. The court is not going to look at that and say, was it sufficient consideration? 
Is that peppercorn worth a million dollars? The court's just going to look at it and say, did you get what you bargained for? And if so, then that is sufficient to be consideration. Okay. Um, so they're not going to look at why did the party bargain for it? They don't care. Doesn't matter. Um, we cannot and we need not guess at a party's motivation. As long as they got what they bargained for, that's enough. So if you got your peppercorn and it cost you a million dollars, then as long as you got it uh, and as long as that's what you contracted for, that is good enough. Okay, consideration. Now, uh, let me take a brief detour here. Your book mentions contracts under seal, all right? Let me start by saying, forget about it. Contracts under seal, it's ancient law. We're in Texas. Contracts under seal are not the law in Texas. And so you do not really need to know about it. The chances of you ever being involved in Texas um, in a contract under seal are really very, very nearly zero. Okay. But since your book mentions it, uh, I'm not going to test you on it. You don't need to know this, but let me at least give you just, just, just 60 seconds on contracts under seal in case in case you ever travel outside Texas and in case you ever run into it. Now, you're not going to run into it everywhere. Uh, there's just a few states left that have some kind of concept of contracts under seal. So if you if you get way up to the northwest in New England somewhere and you happen to be practicing in, um, I forget which states still recognize it, but Maine, I, I believe. If you get up to Maine and you're practicing contract law up there, then maybe you need to know something about contracts under seal. So what are they? Uh, contracts under seal um, are, are contracts where um, the courts recognize they will be enforceable even if there's not consideration, even if there's not consideration going both ways. Uh, something that we may look at and say, you know what, um, under contract law, that's just a gift, right? A promise to do something. And, and when you don't get anything in return, that's just a gift. So in, in Texas, those would not be enforceable. Um, but in a few remaining states, there's at least some concept of this contracts under seal. Why do we call it that? Well, because that's actually where they came from. They came from, you know, old, old, old England, you know, where people still had you know, still wrote out things with quill pens on parchment and they still had things like signet rings, right? And they would they would seal documents with by, by dripping wax on them and, and pressing their signet ring into it and making their seal. Um, and and in ancient common law in, in, in England, um, if you went to that much trouble, right? If you wrote out on a piece of paper, I promise to pay you a million dollars. Um, and you uh, and you wrote that out with your quill pen on parchment, then you folded it up nicely and you put it in an envelope and you dripped wax on it, and then you sealed it with your specific seal, uh, that was enough. The, the courts in England would, would say, okay, we're going to enforce that. Um, today, we don't do that. Today, we're going to call that a gift because you're promising to give a million dollars, you're not getting anything in return. We don't have what you give for what you get. We just have what you give and what the other side gets, right? So contracts under seal, you don't really need to worry about it anymore because we don't have signet rings and those kind of things. And unless you're going to go up and, and practice in like Maine or somewhere like that, you need to know zero about contracts under seal, all right? But if one of you uh, um, leaves the great state of Texas, travels up to New England, find yourself practicing up there, and somebody mentions contracts under seal, then at least maybe it'll ring a bell and you'll know what to uh, think about it, okay? Um, all right, so um, um, let's move on to the next category. Um, I, I just told you that nearly anything can be consideration, uh, even a peppercorn. Um, and now instantly we're gonna start talking about things that are not consideration, things that we would call inequitable consideration. Rem remember, equity means fairness. Um, so things that, 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 that aren't fair to be consideration, things that aren't really consideration. And the idea here is that these things can't be consideration because they're not real, okay? The, the, the consideration, uh, just about anything can be consideration as long as it's real, as long as it's not uh, what the law would call illusory, right? An illusion. Illusory means based on an illusion, not real. So, uh, so nearly anything can be consideration, but it cannot be illusory. It cannot be an illusion. It has to be real, right? The consideration has to be something, something real and something that the courts can control. Um, it can be something tangible. Remember, tangible means, means physical and touchable, right? 
Uh, and so tangible things can certainly be consideration. Um, a car, a house, a dollar bill, right? This pen, a peppercorn, those are all tangible things. You can see them and you can touch them and you can feel them and they can be consideration because they're not illusory, right? Um, but things don't have to be tangible uh, to be real and to be consideration. Um, uh, you know, things like um, um, uh, contract rights and, and, and obligations and duties, right? I mean, if you, um, if you have a contract with a life insurance company, if you die, the contract, uh, the, the life insurance company is going to pay your heirs a million dollars. Well, that's a promise. That's not tangible. You can't touch that promise. But that is nonetheless something that the, the courts can enforce. That's a promise that the courts can make sure that the insurance company lead, uh, uh, lives up to. And so that could be consideration. Let's look at some other examples, though. What about, but what about this? What about if you give me $100, then I'll love you? What about that? Is that, is that consideration? Is that real? Um, and we can certainly have some esoteric, esoteric debate about whether or not love is real, but love is not something the courts can control. It's not something the court can measure or observe. How would the court enforce that contract? If you entered into a contract with somebody, if you give me $100, then I love you, and you gave them $100, uh, and then you went to the court, you know, a, a week, a month, a year later, and you said, Judge, um, I want to sue. I want my money back um, because they breached the contract. I gave $100, and I don't think they love me. How, how would you prove it? How would you look into somebody's mind and see if they loved you? So in that in that situation, the hundred dollars is real consideration, but the, but but so what you're giving is real, but what you're getting is illusory. It's not something uh, that the court can control. Okay, so that that would not be consideration. That would not be a valid enforceable contract. What about that next example? If you give me a hundred dollars, then I won't sue you. Well, you can't touch that. You can't feel it, right? Um, but is it real? Is it a real promise? Is it a real obligation? Is it something the court can enforce? Well, in this situation, sure it is. The court can't make me love you, but they can sure throw my case out if I try to sue you when I contracted not to, when I accepted some consideration in exchange for my promise not to sue you, right? In this situation, both sides are giving, are giving something. Both sides are getting something. I'm giving a hundred dollars. I'm getting a promise not to sue, not to be sued, right? You're getting something. You're getting a hundred dollars and you're giving a promise not to sue. And that promise is enforceable by the courts. So in that situation, we would have consideration. Let's look at another example. Uh, if you give me my car, then I'll think very highly of you. Is that consideration? Is that real? Um, it may or may not be, I guess, real, and again, in kind of a, a philosophical debate, uh, but is it anything that the court can control? If, if I give you my car and then I want to sue you for breach of contract because you don't actually think highly of me, how am I going to prove that, right? And if I want the court to force you to think highly of me, how is the court going to do that? Um, so the, the, the promise... It may, it may be real or not, but it's not enforceable. There's nothing the court can do about it. So in that situation, we would not have a contract supported by consideration. I'm giving you my car, but I'm not getting anything in return. I'm not getting an enforceable promise. You are getting a car, but you're not giving anything in return. You're not giving anything that would be enforceable or that the court could control. So no consideration. Okay, let's look at that. Uh, one more example on this slide. If if you give me your car, then you can sample parts of my song on your next album, right? Um, uh, 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 Kanye West, you know, recently uh, uh, just uh, um, well, uh, this is uh, 2024, and so if you're watching this in 2032, uh, then I've been using this recording for a long time. But but here in the spring of 2024, uh, Kanye West has just uh, is, uh, tried to uh, um, put out a new album, and he immediately got some cease and desist from, from other artists because he claimed that they illegally sampled his work, right? Uh, maybe Kanye should have offered them a car. If you give me uh, your car, then you can sample parts of my song on your next album. Would that be consideration? Uh, you can't, you can't touch a song. You can't touch a right to sample music. Uh, so it's not tangible, but is it, is it a real promise? Absolutely. 
that's absolutely something that the court can enforce, right? Um, if um, if you send um, uh, if, if you send Kanye a cease and desist and say, hey, you can't use my you can't sample my music. Uh, I've got a copyright on that. I've got intellectual property rights in that. And so you can't sample my music. You've got to uh, take your song off the market, right? Or you have to pay me for using my stuff. Is that something the court can do? Absolutely it is, right? That's an enforceable uh, uh, um, uh, intellectual property right, even if it's not tangible. That's something that the court can handle. And so if you give me your car, then I'll give you the right uh, to, to use my intellectual property. That's something the court can enforce, and so if I signed that contract and, and Kanye gave me a car, then if he tried to sample my work and I tried to sue him, he could just point to that contract and ask the court to throw the case out, right? So, so that would be enforceable. That would be consideration. I'm giving a car. I'm getting intellectual property rights. You're getting a car. You're giving intellectual property rights that the court can control and enforce that would be valid consideration. Do you see the difference? Do you see how I love you or I'll think highly of you? Um, it's just not something that the court can, can get hold of. It's not something that the court can enforce. And so a promise that the court can't enforce is not real. It's illusory. The love may be real, maybe not, but the promise to love, right? That's illusory. Uh, there's no way the court can enforce that. All right. Um, so what we're getting to is that the, the promise uh, to give consideration, it must be real. Um, and another important aspect is that it, it can't be based on some arbitrary or subjective standard, right? If, if we make a promise, but the promise is based on just an arbitrary standard that maybe that's only in one person's control, then is it really a promise? And if it's not really a promise, then it's not consideration. Here's an example. Uh, if you give me a hamburger, I'll pay you $10 if I like it, right? Is, is that enforceable consideration? Um, no. How are we going to know? So, so you know what's going to happen. We all know what's going to happen. I give you a hamburger and then you don't pay me because you're going to claim after you eat the whole thing, I didn't like it. And what could the court do? How would the court be able to determine whether you really did like it and you're just lying or you didn't like it? Right. So so there's no consideration there because because there's this arbitrary standard that the court can't weigh, that the court can't, you know, can't possibly objectively measure. So if you give me a hamburger, I promise to pay you ten dollars if I like it. We all know exactly what that means. That's no promise at all. That's if you give me a hamburger, I'm going to eat it and then I'm not going to pay you. Uh, so that would not be consideration. Another example would be if you paint my house, I will pay you five hundred dollars if you do a good job. Okay, well, wh what does that mean? If you do a good job, who's going to judge whether or not you did a good job? Uh, it's not clear from this, right? And so again, we know what's going to happen. You paint my house, and then when you come ask for your money, I'm going to say, nope, you didn't do a good job, and I'm not going to pay you, right? Uh, so that would not be consideration. Now, some of you are starting to think that, um, you know, you've had contracts before where uh, satisfaction was guaranteed, right? You could always send something back and you could get your money back. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, uh, you might even say, well, couldn't this be a good job? Couldn't this be enforceable? What if, um, what if we, we put a jury, uh, we, we ask a jury, well, did you do a good job or not? Right? We can ask a jury, is it a good job? That's, maybe that's a reasonable standard. Um, and that may make it a little different, right? In some situations, if a court is willing to engage in that and say, well, if you do a good job implies a reasonable standard. That implies that it's not just your decision about whether they did a good job, uh, but it's a reasonable standard. And if the court feels like, okay, yes, they can, they can apply a reasonable standard there, then maybe it is consideration. Uh, but if it's just, uh, I'll pay you $500 if I think you did a good job, not going to be consideration, not enforceable. Same thing with this last one. If you do X, fill in the blank. If you do whatever, then I'll pay you what I think it's worth, right? Not consideration, right? That is not a contract. Um, if, um, if you go out to eat and you don't tip your waitress, your waitress can't sue you for breach of contract. You know, when you sat down, the, the, this whole tipping scheme in America is, is, is based on this kind of idea that you serve me and then I'll tip you what I think it's worth. 
um, can you sue me if I don't tip? And the answer is no. No, you can't. Because it's based on this arbitrary standard. There was no contract there. Um, the contract was, I'm going to order the food, I'll pay for the food, and you work for the restaurant. Okay. Um, so if you do something, then I'll pay what I think it's worth. There's no way for the court to enforce that. The court can't determine what you think it's worth, right? And so that promise is illusory. You haven't really promised anything. And as a result, no consideration, all right? Um, again, uh, th this is what I just mentioned a minute ago. There, there are some cases um, where, where the promised consideration may appear to be based on some, 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 some subjective standard, right? On one party's opinion or on one party's uh, feelings. Um, but the court may look at it and say, well, um, th this looks like the parties intended to contract, right? They, they didn't intend for this to be arbitrary. They just maybe didn't, uh, did, didn't state their contract the best possible way. Um, and in that situation, a court may, not must, but, but, but occasionally a court may imply a reasonableness standard, right? In other words, if the parties acted like this was a contract, and, and, uh, and both parties acted that way, um, then the court may do the best it can to find that there really was a contract and that that requires implying a reasonable standard, uh, then sometimes a court will do that, okay? So for instance, uh, I'll pay you $1,000 if you re-roof my house and do it right, right? We may look at that and go, well, that's a subjective standard. Who's gonna determine uh, whether you did it right and so there's no consideration, right? But you know, if the parties wrote that out and, and one side went ahead and, and roofed the house um, and the other side watched them do it, right? And then they said, oh, I don't think you did it right um, and you can't sue me because there's no contract. Court may look at that and go, you know what? I think your actions, I think you guys implied that, that, that this and do it right wasn't going to be left up to you, right? That you all intended that to be a reasonableness standard. And so maybe we can call an expert or maybe we can have the jury determine whether you did it right. Okay, and in, in that case, the, the court may be doing that to, to try to save a contract um, because they just don't think it's fair the other way. And because the parties acted like, you know, they were implying this reasonableness standard. All right, so the, the, the court would be saying that this, this, if you do it right, is more than just what the buyer thinks it's right. Um, it, it, it's implying, well, that, you know, again, we can look at what, what does the industry think is right? Is there an accepted right way to do it? Can a jury determine uh, objectively that, yes, this roof was done right or no, this roof uh, was not done right? Okay. Um, it, it's worth mentioning here, though, if we had this situation and the court found that, no, this is not an enforceable contract because the and I'll pay if you do it right is not an enforceable promise. It's not consideration. Um would there be any other remedies that you could seek, right? This is where we're going to start thinking like a lawyer and start thinking outside the box, big picture. Are there, are there any other remedies uh, that you could bring to bear here? Do you remember our, our, our two equitable remedies we talked about a few weeks ago? We talked about what? Promissory estoppel and quantum merit. Qu promissory estoppel and quantum merit. Uh, promissory estoppel uh, was the one where, you know, that, that often fits when, um, when, when um, we have something that looked kind of like a contract, but there was no consideration in return, right? So promissory estoppel might apply here. Um, this is one where actually quantum, they both might apply. Quantum Merowit might apply as well, right? Uh, you did a job expecting to be paid. They knew you were expecting to be paid. They accepted the benefits and didn't object. Um, you were benefited by it and it would be unfair to let you keep that benefit, right? Quantum Merowit. Uh, so even if a contract, even if a court found that there was no consideration here because that promise to pay was based on a subjective standard, the court's got two options. Um, again, they can say, well, it's not a subjective standard. It was actually a reasonable standard and a jury can consider that. Or the court could check down and say, I'm sorry, it's a subjective standard. That's not consideration. And so this contract is not enforceable, but um, I can enforce this quantum merit remedy. Okay, quantum merit. Uh, remember that from a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's important to talk about the idea of sham consideration, okay? Sham consideration is a little bit different from illusory consideration. Illusory consideration is something that, 
that may kind of look like consideration, but when you really think about it, it's not, right? It's an illusion. It's something the court can't control or the court can't, can't enforce. Like, I'll give you $100 if you love me, right? The court doesn't have any way to measure that. Uh, sham consideration is different. Sham consideration is consideration where something, uh, some specific real consideration may be identified and it may be recited in the contract. It just wasn't actually given. It wasn't actually done, right? Uh, for instance, a, an option contract. Uh, this is an important one. If you guys ever buy a house and you have an option contract that said the buyer has paid $100 and other good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged uh, to support that option, but you never actually give the $100? Well, that's a sham, right? $100 in exchange for an option would be consideration. But just because your contract says it was actually give, given and received, if it wasn't actually given, it's sham consideration. It's not an illusion. $100 is real consideration if you had given it, uh, but you didn't actually give it. You just said you did. And a result, that's sham consideration. Um, and that will not support a contract. Okay, sham consideration, something that you say you did, but you didn't actually do is insufficient to support a contract. It's not real consideration, all right? Um, it's important to, to, to understand the concept, uh, though, when we're talking about sham consideration, it's also important to discuss the concept of nominal consideration. What is nominal consideration? Nominal means uh, in not nom, the root word means a name. So nominal is an adjective meaning in name. Consideration in name. What is nominal consideration? Well. Uh, here's the deal. Sometimes the consideration's already been delivered. And sometimes maybe we have to, to file this contract or the contract's going to be public or uh, you know, we have to file the deed records and we don't want the whole rest of the world knowing our business. Okay. Um, so you've given other consideration, but we don't necessarily need to write it down. So instead, we write down in the contract some, some minimal nominal consideration, something that doesn't represent the full amount of the contract, but is just enough to be that peppercorn. It's just enough um, to support a contract, right? Um, does that make it a sham? No. Um, it means that uh, you've gotten that one little thing and more, right? So, so, so you'll often see... Um, uh, you'll often see statements in, contra in contracts for, um, you know, I'll sell you my house. And the contract that we file in the, the deed record says that for $10 and other good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged, Jeremy sells his house uh, to, uh, to David uh, for, ten, you know, for, for $10 and, and again, for, for $10 and other good and valuable consideration. Uh, am I really going to sell David my house for 10 bucks? No. Um, Am I going to put that in the contract if he hasn't already given me the money? No, right? Uh, but if he's already given me, you know, a million dollars, I don't need the rest of the world to know that I got a million dollars. That's none of their business. And so I put in the contract for $10 and other good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged. What does that mean? It means, hey, he already gave me the consideration and it was more than 10 bucks but we're just going to say that he already gave me at least 10 bucks because that's sufficient consideration to support a contract. All right. Um, we might see that in something called a recital in a contract. What is a recital? Well, a recital is usually just a statement of fact. Um, it, it doesn't usually have obligations. It's just a statement of fact to help people understand or, or explain a contract. Right. Uh, so this contract says I'm giving David my house. Why doesn't it say more about the purchase price? Uh, because the purchase price has already been given. It was, uh, and I'm not just going to say it was already given. I'm going to say it was $10 and more because $10 is at least that peppercorn. It's at least that, that consideration uh, that, that is sufficient to support a contract. Um, what's the difference between that nominal consideration and sham consideration? Well, uh, they, they, they often come from the same place. We often find them in recitals in a contract. The difference is nominal consideration says that I've already received at least this little bit that is, that is sufficient to support a contract and more, and I actually have, right? I actually already got the consideration. Sham consideration 
uh, is when you say that you've done something in a contract and you never actually did. Okay, so if if the contract says I've received ten dollars and other consideration, and I actually have, then that's not a lie. I did receive ten bucks. I received ten bucks and a whole lot more, and that is nominal consideration. If the if the contract says, "Hey, I've already given you a hundred bucks, and I haven't done it at all," well, that is a lie, and that's sham consideration. Okay, so do, do you see the difference between sham consideration and nominal consideration? Uh, when we look at some contracts later, we'll start to discuss more nominal consideration, right? When, when, when part of the exchange has already taken place, maybe we don't need to document the whole thing, but we want to make sure that we put in the contract that some consideration was given in case there's a lawsuit on it so that the courts can see it's a valid contract, all right? Because remember, no consideration, no contract, and to be consideration, both sides have to give something. Both sides have to get something. So even if you've already received it, you may want to write that up to make sure a court knows. All right. Um, what about uh, uh, conditional contracts? Now we're going to get a little more complicated, and um, and we're going to kind of we're going to kind of test this idea of what is illusory and what is real. What is a real promise and what is not a real promise? Okay. So um, you can have conditional contracts. A conditional contract is, is where the something uh, that is given or the something that is received, the something you gave or the something you got, um, doesn't necessarily have to be specifically identifiable or it doesn't necessarily have to be absolute at the, type of, at the time of the contract, okay? The promise to give something may be conditional and that may still be valid consideration as long as the condition is something that is objective and verifiable, okay? Um, uh, so, for instance, remember the old fairy tale? Uh, if you, you know, uh, teach me how to spend, uh, teach me how to spend uh, um, a straw into gold. If you make me rich, then I'll, then I'll name my first child Rumpelstiltskin. Is that a contract? Is that does it, are, are both sides giving something and getting something? What if I never have a kid? You've made me rich, just like you promised, and I never had a kid, so I never had to name it Rumpelstiltskin. So is that a contract? The answer there is yes, because whether or not I have a kid is objectively verifiable, right? Maybe I never have a kid, and that's a chance you took. But you got the promise, the enforceable promise, that if I do have a child, then I will name it Rumpelstiltskin, right? So, so that's not illusory. It's something that may never happen, but at least there's a chance that it happens. And so that is real consideration. Um, another example everyone brings up uh, when we start talking about illusory, uh, illusory consideration is insurance contracts, right? Um, uh, you're required to have auto insurance and you have a big old contract that says, you know, you got to pay a million dollars a month uh, to your to, to Progressive or whoever your car insurance company is for something that you will never get back because you are such a good driver. You never have any accidents. And, and so now you've learned about this idea of illusory consideration. You're like, aha, wait a minute. Um, I'm giving something. They're getting something but they're not giving me anything back. I never got anything because I never had a wreck. So can I sue progressive and try to undo this contract because it never really was a contract because there never really was consideration? And the answer is no, there's, there's definitely consideration there. You pay them your monthly, um, uh, um, uh, you pay them the monthly bill, right? And in exchange, they promise to pay uh, for any uh, any damages that, that you cause or any damages that you have in an accident, right? Even if you never have any damages, even if you never have any accidents, they have still made an enforceable promise. Um, they may not have to follow through because you didn't have any accidents, but whether or not you had any accidents is objectively verifiable. And, and so you didn't get any money out of them, but you did get the enforceable promise that if you had any accidents, they would have to pay. And if they don't pay, if you do have an accident and they don't pay, then you can sue them and the courts can force them to pay. Okay, so, so conditional contracts, when, when one party's obligation to act is based on a condition, 
Um, that's not illusory. Well, that, that may not be illusory, right? If the condition is, if I like it, well, that's illusory because that's not an objective standard, it's subjective. Um, but if the condition is, if you have an accident, right? I'll pay if you have an accident. Well, that's objectively verifiable. And, and, and so that is, um, that is valid consideration. That's something that the court can enforce. Let's take a look at some examples. Um, uh, consideration can be based on, on what we would call a condition precedent. What is a condition precedent? Well, precedent means uh, it's the, the adjective form of, of proceed, right? To go before. Um, so a condition precedent is something that must happen before uh, the, the other side's performance is required. Um, uh, so for instance, um, uh, the buyer will buy a house from seller for $100,000 if the buyer is able to secure financing. Is that a valid contract? Well, what if they never get financing? If they never get financing, then the contract won't ever go through, right? So do we have a contract? And the answer is yes, yes, because this type of contract is not illusory because if the buyer gets financing, then he will be obligated to pay $100,000 for the house, right? That's objectively verifiable. The court can know whether or not he got financing. And if he does get financing, the court can enforce the contract, all right? Now, um, this is splitting hairs. This is peeling the onion pretty thin, but at this point, Usually I've got at least one or two students who go, aha, but what if he never tries to get financing, right? If he never tries to get financing, then his obligation to, to perform is completely within his control. Um, and that's illusory, right? Um, the answer there is that normally courts are, if you make a promise, a conditional promise like this, I will buy your house for $100,000 if I can get financing, and in exchange, I get your promise, okay, I will sell you my house for $100,000 if you can get financing. Um, that, that condition, which is objective and is observable, um, the courts are typically going to imply um, an obligation to use reasonable efforts, right? You have to at least make some attempt to get financing. Um, and if you get financing, then we have two enforceable promises. So it's a conditional contract but based on a condition precedent, a condition that must come before uh, in order to make the contract effective, all right? A condition precedent. Um, consideration, a, a conditional contract may also be based on condition subsequent, okay? On a condition subsequent. So if a, if a condition precedent is something that has to happen before the contract is effective, um, a condition subsequent is something that would happen after the contract. And what do we mean? Well, I mean, if, if the contract's already effective, it's already effective, right? What could, what, what could come after a contract? Well, a condition subsequent is something that, that if it happens, it may allow the parties to undo a contract, okay? So, um, so is the contract illusory? No, because we have a real contract. It's just that one or maybe both of the parties might have a right to undo the contract if some subsequent event occurs, all right? And that's where, I mentioned this earlier, that's where we get contracts like, if you are not satisfied, you may return the product for a full refund, right? Um, you could look at that and go, well, that's an illusory promise. Uh, that's saying, hey, I'm only gonna pay for this if I like it, and if I don't like it, I'm not gonna pay for it. No, it's not the same. Because in this situation, you already completed the contract. You paid for it, you got the item. There's an exchange of consideration, right? You got the item, you gave money. The seller got money, they gave the item. Both sides gave and got something. We have a valid contract supported by valid consideration. But one party has the right to undo the contract, come back later and say, you know what? I didn't really like it after all, so I'm going to give it back for a refund. So, so why do we say that we have a valid contract even if there's a condition subsequent? Because the contract was actually completed. It was a real, final, um, executed contract. It's just that one party had the right to undo it, okay? Uh, if they don't exercise the right, if they don't bring the product back, they don't get their money back, then we still have a contract, right? And the contract was completed. Um, or, you know, what if you, um, what if you paid with a credit card or something or you haven't paid yet? but you kept the item. Well, you kept the item so I can sue you for breach of contract, right? You promised to pay in exchange for the item. Um, you just had a, a condition subsequent, right? To undo that contract 
um, uh, based on some standard, um, and you never did return the item. So we still have a valid binding contract. All right. So a conditional contracts, you got to be careful. Uh, they may look like they're illusory, um, but the question is, can the court enforce this contract based on some objective standards? And if it's a condition precedent, something that has to happen before the contract is effective, um, that's still a contract as long as that condition precedent is something objectively verifiable. Um, and a condition subsequent, something where somebody can undo the contract if they want to, um, is still a contract because the contract is complete um, and it remains a valid contract unless somebody comes back and undoes it. Okay, so conditions subsequent, conditions precedent, conditional contracts are not illusory. They are actually supported by consideration uh, and they are enforceable. Uh, let me give you some other examples of conditional contracts. Um, these are a little more complicated. These are things that maybe you haven't thought about unless, uh, unless you've been in business before, right? Um, we have things like output contracts and needs contracts, exclusive dealings contracts, cost plus contracts. These are all conditional contracts. These are contracts where um, people have entered into agreements and nobody knows exactly uh, how this how this contract is going to turn out. Nobody knows exactly what's being sold. They may not know the exact price, and yet they still have a contract. Um, let me explain what some of these contracts are, what they might look like, okay? Um, so uh, an output contract, um, let me see, I think I've got a slide on this. Uh, I did a different one. Let's start with a needs contract, okay? A needs contract is where a, a, a buyer contracts with a seller and they don't say, hey, I want to buy one widget or I want to buy 10 widgets or I want to buy a million widgets. Instead, they say, look, I don't know if I'm going to need any widgets at all, but I will promise to buy all the widgets I need from you exclusively if you will give me a good price, right? Um, and so the seller says, okay, well, if you agree to buy all your widgets from me, then I'll give you a price of X. Do we have a contract? Um, yes. We don't know if the buyer is ever going to need any widgets, but if they do, they can only buy them from seller because they have signed a needs contract. I'm going to buy all of my needs from you. You're going to sell me all that I order at this price, right? We see those in, uh, in many different industries. We see those a lot of times in, um, in like tech industries, right? Uh, computer manufacturers. Now that we've, uh, 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 Dell Computers was kind of a leader in that, right? They, they, they dragged us into this um, uh, just-in-time uh, supply chain model, right? Where um, you order a computer, Dell, they've gotten bigger now. So now they, they do build some and they have some sitting around in stock. They you know, sell some to Best Buy, but, but in general, they, they build them just in time. When you order a computer, then Dell starts building the computer. Um, and they don't want to have a whole bunch of stock sitting on the shelf that may or may not be used. So when you order a computer, then they order the parts to make your computer. Um, and so they may have a needs contract with their supplier. If we need memory chips, we'll buy them from you. Um, and in exchange, if, if we agree to buy all of our memory chips from you uh, that we need, then you agree to give us you know, a pretty good price. Um, uh, that's, that, that's an enforceable contract because if they need to buy memory chips, then they have to buy them from that manufacturer, right? Um, and then the manufacturer has promised a specific price. Um, but if they don't ever buy any, have they breached the contract? No, not if they don't need any. Now, if they go buy them from somebody else, they've breached the contract, right? They they agreed to to um, they agreed to buy all of their chips from AMD, right? They agreed to buy all their processors from AMD, and um, then they went and bought some processors from Microsoft. Um, they violated that needs contract. They needed chips. They didn't buy them from AMD. They bought them from somebody else. That's still an enforceable promise, even if they never order any chips from anybody, even if they never have to pay anything. That would be a needs contract, okay? Um, those are similar to uh, output contracts. Output contracts are kind of the opposite of that. Uh, that's where a, a buyer agrees to buy all uh, of a product that a seller um, uh, can put out, right? 
Um, so we don't know whether the seller's ever going to have to buy anything because we don't know if the buyer, I'm sorry, we don't know if the buyer is ever going to have to buy anything because we don't know if the seller is ever going to have anything to buy. But if the seller does produce something, then the buyer is obligated to pay for it. Okay. And so we have a contract. We see these in uh, off, we see contracts like this often in, in a lot of different places, uh, but especially in, um, um, in agriculture, right? In farming, um, a, a farmer may enter into a contract with, uh, with a grain elevator at the beginning of the season before he's even planted his crops um, or shortly after he's planted his crops, but they haven't come up yet. Uh, he's trying to lock in a good price for his, uh, uh, for his crop. And he says, hey, you know, I'll sell you all the wheat I produce at $10 a bushel, you know, $5 a bushel, whatever, whatever the reason. And they sign that contract. Well, is the, is the farmer ever going to sell any grain to that grain elevator? I don't know. It depends on if he produces any. But if he produces any, he's going to have to sell it to the grain elevator. How much is he going to have to sell? All that he produces. Do we know how much that, that, that amount is? No. Uh, but we still have a real contract because those are objectively verifiable facts. Okay, so a needs contract, I'm gonna, if I need any, I'm going to buy it all from you. That's a valid contract. An output contract, if I manufacture any, if I produce any, I'm going to sell it to you and you're going to buy it. Um, we have an exchange of enforceable promises there. Uh, that's a conditional contract, but it is still valid consideration. Uh, the next one is an exclusive dealings contract. What's an exclusive dealings contract? Well, that's where the parties agree that they may or may not do any business. But if they do, they will only do it with each other, right? It's kind of a, almost a combination of the two, right? An exclusive dealings contract. Um, what might that look like? Why would, you, why would you even want to have something like that? Well, um, how about uh, Tiger Woods, LeBron James, right? If, if you want LeBron James to... Uh, to to um, advertise, to market your shoes, right? Then he's going to want a bunch of money. And if you're going to pay LeBron James to market your shoes, uh, yeah, your basketball shoes, you want to make sure that he's not going to go out and advertise for any other shoe companies, right? It doesn't do you any good if, he, if he's out there advertising every kind of shoe on the market. You want him to deal exclusively with you. And LeBron says, okay, but I'm not sure if I actually want to do any commercials. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to promise that I will do any commercials. Um, and, um, but we'll sign a contract. You pay me something and, and I'll promise that, um, uh, or you agree to pay me if I do a commercial and in exchange, I'll promise I won't do any commercials for anyone else. Right. Are they ever going to do business? Are they ever going to exchange any money? Maybe not. Are those promises illusory? No, because they're enforceable. If LeBron James agrees to make any commercials, he has to make them for this company because he signed an exclusive dealings contract. If LeBron James shoots a commercial for this company, then they have to pay him, right? Because they made a promise. Uh, those are objectively identifiable. So that would be an exclusive dealings contract where, where two companies or two individuals agree to deal exclusively with each other, right? Um, we might also see those in the tech business uh, where, you know, where somebody agrees, well, I, I may not need to buy any memory chips, but if I do, I'm only going to buy them from you, right? Um, or I'm going to, uh, uh, in retail stores, I'm going to sell, you know, something and I'll only sell your brand. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to buy any of your brand to, to, to resell, but if I do, you know, I'm only going to buy your brand. Uh, so an exclusive dealings contract. Um, Tell you what, let's go over these three more examples and then we'll, uh, then we'll cut it off for, for this lecture. Uh, you can also have a cost plus contract. What is a cost plus contract? Well, in some industries, you know, you, you, you can't finish the contract instantly, right? It's going to take some time, uh, maybe a construction contract, right? Uh, you're going to build a highway. You expect this project to take two or three or four years. Um, and so if you're the, if you're the contractor, you know, in two or three or four years, there could be inflation. The, the price of materials could go way up. And so you'd have to figure that into your bid, right? And, and so maybe when you bid the contract, you have to pad your bid and make it a lot higher because you're worried about inflation. Um, the, 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 the government entity that's looking to get somebody to build a road, though, they're not sure there's going to be any inflation. Right. Heck, we might have deflation. Maybe the price of of those those goods, go, the, 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 the resources goes down. So they want to sign a contract that says they're going to pay much higher prices for stuff two or three years from now because the prices might go up. 
what are they to do? The, 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 uh, the, the contractor doesn't want to take the chance that, that prices of, of supplies goes up and the government doesn't want to sign a contract promising to pay higher prices uh, for things that may not ever go up. What do they do? Well, they could sign a cost plus contract. A cost plus contract recognizes that the, the prices of those inputs may change and says, okay, I'm going to do the work and I will agree to do the work. We're not going to fix a price for this contract. We're going to say, I'll do the work for my cost plus my reasonable, uh, 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 my, my reasonable profit, right? We're going to figure out what the profit is. Maybe that's 10%, maybe it's 2%, maybe it's 0.1%. It depends on the size of the contract, right? In the industry. Uh, but that way, that way both parties are insulated from that unsurety, right? Um, so if, uh, if, a, if a contractor agrees to build you a highway for a cost plus 10%, well, then he's going to make a, he's going to make a profit of 10%, right? What is he going to charge you? Well, it's still, even though you don't know it at the time of the contract, it's still based on objectively verifiable facts. If the price of steel and the price of concrete and the price of labor goes up, then he'll charge more, but he can show his receipts. He can show how much he spent. And then you owe him that much plus 10% more, right? Um, but the, the government is protected uh, and they don't have to sign a contract and give away the farm because if prices don't go up, then they still get the benefit of the lower prices, right? They're only paying 10% more than whatever it costs you to buy the stuff, okay? So that would be a cost plus contract, definitely conditional. At the beginning of the contract, we, don't, we, we can't tell you how much this is going to cost in, in exact dollars and cents because it depends on the future. It depends on how much supplies cost. Nonetheless, it's objectively verifiable um, because we can tell how much you spent. We can tell how much things cost when that happens. So that's a cost plus contract. Um, we may have things uh, called an allowance in a contract. What is an allowance? Well, an allowance is, a, is usually a, a, a term, a, a part of a bigger contract. It's, it's usually an indefinite term in a, in a contract where um, the contract doesn't set a specific price for a specific item, but instead sets a range, right? So, so in, for example, you're building a house. Uh, somebody, you want to have your house built, and so you hire a contractor, but you haven't decided, you haven't settled on every single last nitpicky detail. You don't know what color you're going to paint the living room. You don't know whether you're going to put in carpet or hardwood floors. You haven't picked out which light fixtures or, or which plumbing fixtures you want, right? Um, you may have picked out a thousand things, but there's always little details um, that maybe you just haven't gotten to yet. And so that may be a good place for an allowance contract. That would look like this. Um, you agree with the builder. Uh, here's the here's the blueprints. Here's the house generally, and you agree to build this house for a hundred thousand dollars, right? You're going to build it for a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to pay it a hundred thousand dollars for you to build it, but I haven't decided on light fixtures yet. So we're going to put in that contract a five thousand dollar allowance, right? I'm going to pay you a hundred thousand dollars to build the house. You're going to build the house for $100,000, and I haven't decided on light fixtures yet, but I still get to pick them in as long as those light fixtures come in under $5,000, under that allowance amount, uh, then we're good, and the price of the contract stays the same, okay? That would be an allowance. So again, we don't know all of the consideration. We don't know, uh, you know, you're paying $100,000 for a house. We don't know what kind of light fixtures it's going to have yet. But we do know that as long as you eventually pick light fixtures that are under the allowance amount, then we're all good. What if you want to pick uh, fixtures that are over the allowance amount? Well, that's not going to fall in this contract. Um, and you would, have to, you would have to do a modification of the contract. You might have to amend the contract to allow for more money on fixtures. And as a result, you might have to modify the price, right? You might have to pay more. Uh, but that would be an allowance contract. You can see how that's based on a condition. It's based on the condition of what fixtures are you going to pick in the future? Um, and even though that's conditional, it's not based on a condition like if I like it or if I love you. It's based on a condition that is verifiable. I'm going to pick fixtures. And as long as they're under $5,000, then we still have a contract. All right. That's an allowance contract. Uh, the last one is an incentive contract. These are becoming more popular and they can be outstanding in the right places. What is an incentive contract? An incentive contract is a contract where... Um, where we build in extra money, usually, uh, to encourage somebody to do a better job or to move faster, 
Okay. So uh, why is it a conditional contract? Well, because we don't know what the final price of the contract is going to be. We don't know what the final, the, the final amount is going to be until we get to the end of the contract because there's an incentive. What does that look like? Well, um, these work great in, in construction contracts, especially like uh, road and bridges and that kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, if you're from Dallas, if you lived here very long, do you remember back when they were working on 75? It took forever, it took decades to get that finished, right? Uh, we think that's just the norm for, for building roads, right? They always take forever. They always run over. The contractors are always late. Well, um, what if we built in an incentive? You know, this high five interchange at 75 and 635? Um, they built an incentive in that contract. In that contract, they said, okay, um, um, you're going to complete this contract in three years, right? We're going to pay you what, $50 million to build these bridges, um, and you've got three years to do it. Um, all right, we got a contract, but we're going to build in an incentive. If you're early, we're going to pay you uh, $10,000 a day for every day that you're early up to maybe a million dollars, right? Um, you can go the other way. If you're late, we're going to knock off $10,000 for every day you're late um, up to, you know, maybe a million dollars. So at the beginning of the contract, when the contract signed, we don't know what the actual amount of that contract is going to be. It's conditional because it's based on this incentive. But that incentive is still based on an objectively verifiable fact. When do you get the project done? You can tell how that would how that would be effective. Um, this high five interchange, they had an incentive contract. I don't remember the exact details, but it was something like, you know, if you finish the contract early, um, we'll give you um, ten thousand dollars a day extra for every day that you're early, up to a hundred days early, right? Um, how do you think that contract worked out? How do you think that uh, how do you think that contractor did? Do you think they were late? No, they were early. How early were they? What was the maximum amount they could recover? Uh, the maximum bonus they could get is if they were 100 days early, they were 100 days early, right? They maxed it out. Instead of that contract being way over and, and being, you know, months and weeks and months and years late, we built an incentive. We gave them a financial incentive to be early, and so they were. That's an incentive contract. That incentive is conditional, so we don't know exactly what the consideration is going to be in, in the contract, but we can still determine it based on objectively verifiable facts. How early were you? Now we can just do the math, right? So that's not illusory. Uh, that's something that the court can enforce. That would be valid consideration for a contract. Okay, we've been going for about an hour, so I'm going to stop there. Um, and when we come back, we'll finish the second half uh, of chapter five on consideration. All right, I'll see you there. Thanks.